1 Chronicles chapter 11 All Israel came together to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, even while Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord your God said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, he made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel, as the Lord had promised through Samuel. David and all the Israelites marched to Jerusalem, that is, Jebus. The Jebusites who lived there said to David, You will not get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. David had said, Whoever leads the attack on the Jebusites will become commander-in-chief. Joab, son of Zeruiah, went up first, and so he received the command. David then took up residence in the fortress, and so it was called the City of David. He built up the city around it, from the terraces to the surrounding wall, while Joab restored the rest of the city. And David became more and more powerful, because the Lord Almighty was with him. These were the chiefs of David's mighty warriors. They, together with all Israel, gave his kingship strong support to extend it over the whole land as the Lord had promised. This is the list of David's mighty warriors. Yashobiam, a Hakmonite, was chief of the officers. He raised his spear against three hundred men, whom he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai the Ahohite, one of the three mighty warriors. He was with David at Pazdamin, when the Philistines gathered there for battle. At a place where there was a field full of barley, the troops fled from the Philistines. But they took their stand in the middle of the field, they defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. Three of the thirty chiefs came down to David to the rock at the cave of Adalam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water, and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out to the Lord. God forbid that I should do this, he said. Should I drink the blood of these men who went at the risk of their lives? Because they risked their lives to bring it back, David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. Abishai, the brother of Joab, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against three hundred men, whom he killed, and so he became as famous as the three. He was doubly honoured above the three and became their commander, even though he was not included among them. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant fighter from Kabziel, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down an Egyptian who was five cubits tall. Although the Egyptian had a spear like a weaver's rod in his hand, Benaiah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. He too was as famous as the three mighty warriors. He was held in greater honor than any of the thirty, but he was not included among the three. And David put him in charge of his bodyguard. The mighty warriors were Azahel, the brother of Joab, Elhanan, son of Dodo from Bethlehem, Shamoth, the Herorite, Hilez, the Pelonite, Ira, son of Ikesh from Tekoa, Abaiza from Anathoth, Sibekai, the Huyushathite, Ilei, the Ahohite, Meherai, the Natophathite, Heled, son of Baana, the Natophathite, Itei, son of Ribei, from Gibeah in Benjamin, Benaiah, the Pyrathonite, Hurei, 
from the ravines of Gayash, Abayel the Arbathite, Asmeveth the Baherumite, Eliabah the Shealbonite, the sons of Hashem the Geizanite, Jonathan son of Sheji the Herarite, Ahiam son of Sekar the Herarite, Eliphal son of Ur, Hepha the Makirathite, Ahijah the Pelonite, Hezro the Carmelite, Nehari son of Ezbei, Joel the brother of Nathan, Mibhaz son of Hagrai, Zelek the Ammonite, Nehari the Beerothite, the armor bearer of Joab, son of Zeruiah, Ira the Ithrite, Gareb the Ithrite, Uriah the Hittite, Zabad son of Alei, Adina son of Shizar the Reubenite, who was chief of the Reubenites, and the thirty with him, Hanan son of Maaka, Joshaphat the Mithnite, Aziah the Ashtirathite, Shema and Jeiel the sons of Hotham the Arorite, Jediael son of Shimrai, his brother Joha the Tizite, Eliel the Mehavite, Jerebai and Joshiviah the sons of Elnaam, Ithma the Moabite, Eliel, Obed, and Jehaziel the Mezobeite. 1 Chronicles chapter 12 These were the men who came to David at Ziklag, while he was banished from the presence of Saul, son of Kish. They were among the warriors who helped him in battle. They were armed with bows, and were able to shoot arrows or to sling stones right-handed or left-handed. They were relatives of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. Ahiezer, their chief, and Joash, the sons of Shemaiah, the Gibeathite, Jeziel and Peleth, the sons of Asmaveth, Berekah, Jehu, the Anathathite, and Ishmaiah, the Gibeonite, a mighty warrior among the thirty who was a leader of the thirty, Jeremiah, Jehaziel, Jehanan, Josabad, the Gadirathite, Eluzei, Jerimoth, Bealiah, Shemariah, and Shephatiah, the Harufite, Elkanah, Ishiah, Azarel, Joezer, and Jeshobiam, the Korahites, and Joela and Zebediah, the sons of Jeroham, from Gedor. Some Gadites defected to David at his stronghold in the wilderness. They were brave warriors, ready for battle and able to handle the shield and spear. Their faces were the faces of lions, and they were as swift as gazelles in the mountains. Ezer was the chief, Obadiah the second in command, Eliab the third, Mishmanah the fourth, Jeremiah the fifth, Atei the sixth, Eliel the seventh, Yohanan the eighth, Elzabad the ninth, Jeremiah the tenth, and Machbani the eleventh. These Gadites were army commanders. The least was a match for a hundred, and the greatest for a thousand. It was they who crossed the Jordan in the first month when it was overflowing all its banks, and they put to flight everyone living in the valleys to the east and to the west. Other Benjaminites and some men from Judah also came to David in his stronghold. David went out to meet them and said to them, If you have come to me in peace to help me, I am ready for you to join me. But if you have come to betray me to my enemies when my hands are free from violence, may the God of our ancestors see it and judge you. Then the Spirit came on Amasai, chief of the thirty, and he said, We are yours, David. We are with you, son of Jesse. Success, success to you, and success to those who help you, for your God will help you. So David received them and made them leaders of his raiding bands. Some of the tribe of Manasseh defected to David when he went with the Philistines to fight against Saul. He and his men did not help the Philistines, because after consultation their rulers sent him away. They said, It will cost us our heads if he deserts to his master Saul. When David went to Ziklag, these were the men of Manasseh who defected to him. Adna, Jozabad, Jediael, Michael, Jozabad, Elihu, and Zilathai, leaders of units of a thousand in Manasseh. They helped David against raiding bands, for all of them were brave warriors, and they were commanders in his army. Day after day men came to help David, until he had a great army, 
like the army of God. These are the numbers of the men armed for battle who came to David at Hebron to turn Saul's kingdom over to him as the Lord had said. From Judah, carrying shield and spear, 6,800 armed for battle. From Simeon, warriors ready for battle, 7,100. From Levi, 4,600, including Jehoiada, leader of the family of Aaron, with 3,700 men, and Zadok, a brave young warrior with 22 officers from his family. From Benjamin, Saul's tribe, 3,000, most of whom had remained loyal to Saul's house until then. From Ephraim, brave warriors famous in their own clans, 20,800. From half the tribe of Manasseh, designated by name to come and make David king, 18,000. From Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do, 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. From Zebulun, experienced soldiers prepared for battle with every type of weapon to help David with undivided loyalty, 50,000. From Naphtali, 1,000 officers together with 37,000 men carrying shields and spears. From Dan, ready for battle, 28,600. From Asher, experienced soldiers prepared for battle, 40,000. And from east of the Jordan, from Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, armed with every type of weapon, 120,000. All these were fighting men who volunteered to serve in the ranks. They came to Hebron, fully determined to make David king over all Israel. All the rest of the Israelites were also of one mind to make David king. The men spent three days there with David, eating and drinking, for their families had supplied provisions for them. Also their neighbours, from as far away as Issachar, Zebulun and Naphtali, came bringing food on donkeys, camels, mules and oxen. There were plentiful supplies of flour, fig cakes, raisin cakes, wine, olive oil, cattle and sheep, for there was joy in Israel. 1 Chronicles chapter 13 David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. He then said to the whole assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you, and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our people throughout the territories of Israel, and also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands, to come and join us. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. The whole assembly agreed to do this, because it seemed right to all the people. So David assembled all Israel, from the river Shihor in Egypt to Lebo Hamath, to bring the ark of God from kiriath Jearim. David and all Israel went to Baala of Judah, kiriath Jearim, to bring up from there the ark of God the Lord, who is enthroned between the cherubim, the ark that is called by the name. They moved the ark of God from Abinadab's house on a new cart, with Uzzah and Ahio guiding it. David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before God with songs and with harps, lyres, tambourines, cymbals and trumpets. When they came to the threshing floor of Kidon, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah, and he struck him down because he had put his hand on the ark. So he died there before God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day that place is called Pires Uzzah. David was afraid of God that day, and asked, How can I ever bring the ark of God to me? He did not take the ark to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house for three months, and the Lord blessed his household and everything he had. Acts chapter 9 Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, 
so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, Something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who caused havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. As Peter travelled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralysed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, 
Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became ill and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood round him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Psalm 138 I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name. For your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Proverbs chapter 14 The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands the foolish one tears hers down. Whoever fears the Lord walks uprightly, but those who despise him are devious in their ways. A fool's mouth lashes out with pride, but the lips of the wise protect them. Where there are no oxen, the manger is empty, but from the strength of an ox come abundant harvests. An honest witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. The mocker seeks wisdom and finds none. But knowledge comes easily to the discerning. Stay away from a fool, for you will not find knowledge on their lips. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of fools is deception. Fools mock at making amends for sin, but goodwill is found among the upright. Each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Even in laughter the heart may ache, and rejoicing may end in grief. The faithless will be fully repaid for their ways, and the good rewarded for theirs. The simple believe anything but the prudent give thought to their steps. The wise fear the Lord and shun evil, but a fool is hot-headed and yet feels secure. 
A quick-tempered person does foolish things, and the one who devises evil schemes is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Evildoers will bow down in the presence of the good, and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The poor are shunned even by their neighbors, but the rich have many friends. It is a sin to despise one's neighbor, but blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. Do not those who plot evil go astray? But those who plan what is good find love and faithfulness. All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. The wealth of the wise is their crown, but the folly of fools yields folly. A truthful witness saves lives, but a false witness is deceitful. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. A large population is a king's glory, but without subjects a prince is ruined. Whoever is patient has great understanding, but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. When calamity comes, the wicked are brought down, but even in death the righteous seek refuge in God. Wisdom reposes in the heart of the discerning, and even among fools she lets herself be known. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. A king delights in a wise servant, but a shameful servant arouses his fury.